for today's event. And I would like to uh, greet our guest, uh, Ingela Johansson, Divya Pahdi, and Professor Nestorte. And uh, I would like to introduce first Divya Pahdi, who is a curator based in Budapest. And um, she was the uh, director of the Baltic Art Center in BP uh, in Sweden between 2012-2015. And uh, before she worked at the Kunsthalle Budapest as curator and chief curator, she was also one of the cultural agents of the Kumenta team. And actually she is now part of the curatorial team of UBNR in Budapest next year. Uh, with Livia, we were uh, talking about what uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, event we could uh, organize uh, for uh, the Bratislava Art Team, and we agreed that it would be perhaps interesting to show artistic practices based on uh, collaboration and cooperation when we are dealing also with uh, uh, in situ or, or, or local contact or a site-specific uh, uh, site issue. And actually the work Lydia had, Lydia had in the Baltic Art Center was more or less about this typical task, how to uh, combine and bring together uh, issues of local, national and international relevance. Somehow uh, we arrived that uh, probably the best would be if she is uh, then on her turn inviting artists with whom she collaborated during uh, her uh, uh, practice in PP. Uh, and uh, that's why uh, we have now uh, Ingela and Otta here. And I would like uh, Livia to introduce them because they worked together for uh, one year. And uh, I just would like to say that it is the first time we also announced an open call for a workshop with uh, our guest, which will take place tomorrow. And uh, we would like also to continue to present uh, here in Bratislava uh, international artists with the practices and the curatorial center. So I am uh, giving the floor to you. Thank you. So hello everybody, um, thanks for coming tonight and I'd like to thank Judith and the transit team uh, both for the invitation and all the organization and the preparation and I'm not going to be very, uh, I'm going to be short with the introduction and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the three of us came together and I'd like to introduce first uh, also Sonia's daughter with whom I think we've just realized we've known each other for 11 years. She already came to do a project in 2006, probably, or 2005, in, in the Kunsthal Budapest, where I work. Um, and she's an artist who's based in, uh, who's from Sweden, but based in, uh, based in Berlin for over like 10 years. And she was also like uh, the groundbreaking kind of uh, initiator and founder of the Tromsø Art Academy. And uh, she's done a lot of uh, different projects regarding sustainability. And she was, she's the funding member of the Neighborhood Academy. It's a bottom-up learning uh, site and the branch of the Princess Cinnamon Garden in Berlin. And uh, Inga Johansson became our research in residence at uh, VSP at the Baltic Art Center last year. And she's, um, she's a Stockholm-based artist who is very much response to site-specific issues and works a lot with, with archives. And she's going to talk about a, a long research project, project that also became as a book, The Art of Strike, that was published in 2013 by Glanta. And uh, the latest projects included like uh, Moving Mass in Kalmar and The Other Eyes of the City in Kunzbaka in Sweden. And, um, and I'd like to thank you both to, to accept the invitation and come in here. So it's a kind of a, you know, I'm, I don't work in Visby anymore, but I think it's a kind of a post to be a condition. And um, I also put up a little map, so I'll, I'll, I'll start my presentation with a little geography lesson, so that I'm not so sure that everybody knows where Gotland is. So you see this island with this bee uh, in the middle of the Baltic Sea, 200 kilometers on the south of Stockholm. And this, this uh, island is like a 55,000 inhabited island, kind of famous for a lot of things. It's a very interesting buffer zone between east and the west. It's been always an important part of the Swedish defense that had a military that slowly moved out in the 90s and slowly moved back 
uh, in the last few years. Um, this is a place where you also like um, have some other islands. On the, on the north you can see Foro, where Ingmar Bergman lived for 40 years, who died in 2007. And this island also is very known for different kind of industrial sites. It has a limestone mining, it has a cement industry, and it was also a very important Hanseatic uh, town, Bisbee, between the 12th and the 14th century. It has a couple of, I just thought like I would give a little bit of an introduction to the background and a little bit of a touristy touch to the, to the, uh, uh, to my presentation. So you can see a couple of important landscapes and the kind of inspirations. It was also a Viking spot, so it's been a very, very heavy kind of historical and geographical site. This is this famous rock formations that also talks about millions of geological history, millions of years of geological history. Then you can see a little bit of the industrial industrial site, which is more on the northeast part of the island, which has also been a spot which, which inspired a couple of artists that we worked with during the last four and a half years. And this is something of another side, it's like a, a mining town, Slita, which is also on the northeast, um, with some working quarries and, and salmon factory. This is another place, so more like the north, uh, uh, southeast, which, is, which was the site of Tarkovsky's sacrifice. Um, it was made in 86, that actually Ingele is going to talk about tomorrow, because she made a film which is very much connected and based on, on, on this film. And of course, he is the, the big hero of the island, uh, Ingmar Bergman, that is also at Bergman Week, end of June, about his legacy. Um, and there are some more funny things that also kind of uh, inspire the context of the island and also Wispy. This is a political week which was, was funded in the 80s. And this means that a whole political crowd from, from Sweden uh, comes together for a week, first, of, first week of July. And another thing which is more for, for another part of crowd is the medieval week in August that brings together a lot of people more from outside of this week um, and also all from Sweden. Um, this is just for a little bit of a, I think, um, how would I say, a reminder that there were better times for the social democrats of Palmer's speech 68. Olof Palmer was assassinated in 86 and he was the hero of social democracy in Sweden and this was some of the speeches that inspired Bolivia. And this is a kind of the delirious Visby city wall that also Visby became UNESCO World Heritage in 1995 and this is the, basically the legacy of the, of the Hansa which gives the island a little bit of a, and especially Visby, a sort of evil touch so that's the part of the heritage that is actually very much focused on. And then we arrive to, to basically the inner side of Bisbee and on the yes, on the right side of the image you see a granary called Virkandershka. This is where the Baltic Arts Center has been situated since uh, its foundation in 1999-2000. It started as a, I just showed two images of like how it looks now, but uh, before we get back there, it was an institution that was funded as a Kunsthalle. So it has an exhibition program and it started a very specific residency since 2004, the production in residency, which meant that the institution took the production into residence, not necessarily the artist, and gave enough time, energy, and, and also help to produce and finance uh, uh, productions that could take from one year to, to five. And then from 2007, that was uh, definitely like, also financially and culture politically, that was a certain kind of decision to cut back the institution, which started to work with artists uh, like with William Gantridge, um, Rosa Barba, and Fiona Tan. And then the whole institution moved into a more kind of, how would I say, more reserved, kind of more modest situation, which was a residency since 2007. And, and the program from then on until I came was more about trying to figure out different kind of workshops, seminars that focused a lot on production and, and the analysis of what artistic production is, what artistic production has to do with labor. It's a lot, lot of more kind of, how would I say, insiders, uh, group, group collaborations and, and discussions and different kind of residences that were very much thematized by how, how this institution can sort of uh, contribute to that discussion. And since 2012, I, when I came, came to Bach, um, I was confronted with a lot of kind of a set of questions 
regarding both the operation and how to move on in, a, in an again new financial and um, cultural political situation and also like what can I do with my legacy as a, as a basically a classical curator coming from the Kunsthalle Budapest that had a more than 2,000 square meter um, exhibition space and where I did actually different kind of group and um, monographic shows, different kind of programs. So it was also a question about changing culture, um, changing a different kind of mentality um, and, and figuring out how that package, this Eastern European package, can fit with a very specific Swedish surrounding. The island itself is also a microstate, so it's a kind of a, how would I say, a, a microsystem that talks a lot about uh, the different historical layers. So my point of view to start the conversation with the island and with the artists that I, I uh, wanted to invite was a lot about this kind of historical, historical gaps and this kind of historical legacies. So based on my um, based on my formal kind of institutional uh, curatorial um, experience, I, my aim was to explore a little bit the so-called alternative historical narrations and different kind of uh, narratives and different kind of stories of the 20th century that was kind of hidden or left out from the main medieval dialogue. And I also tried to figure out a different um, understanding of how of the making of cultural, social, political narratives and concepts of heritage. And for this, I have selected artists to work on specific case studies and also kind of try to focus on the island but also bring in some international expert knowledge. Um, this was actually kind of, I leave it because this is one of the pictures that I made at the very beginning and it was very, very important for me from the beginning. And um, Okay, so the first of all I did in 2012 a certain kind of case study got on meeting where I met all the people, practitioners um, on the island, professionals, different kind of organizations that actually worked with international and, uh, and regional art on Gotland and also on Foro and to kind of bring about and discuss ideas of how we could actually collaborate. And this kind of created also a base um, where researchers can could look at specific chapters of Swedish social, political, and cultural history. Our main focus was basically the Second World War and, and the post-war uh, situation, also about modernization of Sweden, the Swedish model. And so the idea was to propose new readings and new comparativities to Gotland as well. So between the 2014, let me skip, 2014 in May and February 2015, um, we sort of uh, organized a couple of seminars, three seminars, with different themes. And uh, each chapter focused on a specific subject, a specific genre, and their approach to invited artistic case studies and organizations. And so the three expert meetings, you see a picture of the first one, that's actually, I mean, Osa, Osa will probably maybe mention Lena Nigards, who who is, who is actually a researcher on seed history. She has a very specific communist approach to, to, to female agriculture on the island, and she was very kind to host us in 2014 May, and, and maybe like on the right side, you don't really see his face, but he was also exhibiting here a transit, Tomasz Kostanas, and there is also like the butterfly woman is Elsa Dittwurst, who is a very interesting Belgian artist who actually moved to Ireland kind of I don't even remember if it was seven years ago. And she became a shepherd with her partner Olavari, who's a performance artist from Dublin. And then we have uh, also some other guests and also some, some regional collaborators. And so basically Future Island was um, was kind of addressed various notions such as publicness multidisciplinary working, context and site specificity, approaches to artistic and the moving image research, and experimentation also in time-based forms, because we wanted to, f to form certain kind of collaborative structures with different universities and, uh, and departments. And this kind of explorations, especially the chapter three, that was very much connected to the north northeast part of um, northeast part of the island, because then we suddenly changed this and different sessions took place that also involved the communities. That my uh, 
my colleague Anna Norbe was very helpful in that. She lived in the area and she was very much about articulate a certain kind of discussion with, with different local communities. And um, also during the public evening, we tried to share like how contemporary art and the different kind of public case studies um, would sort of fit into the program of kind of urban renewal, regeneration of former industrial sites, kind of a biodiversity restoration. So the quarry that I was showing to you in Slita and this mining town, basically there is a plan to, to regenerate biodiversity after one of these big quarries are going to be are going to be closed down in the next 20 years. So there were lots of different kind of energies and different kind of discussions coming together. And the I Basically, during my years, when I also like helped co-produce certain kind of artworks, videos, films, and different kind of residences, I realized that also to change and transform the institution, it's not happening without, without really grounding specific projects and specific discussions within the local community. And uh, the other reason was as well, because you know I'm probably not telling a secret that there wasn't a large audience for contemporary arts. Basically, I think what I can say is from five people to maybe 25 that were really kind of interested and followed a certain kind of contemporary art discourse. So this also kind of makes you change from this kind of more kind of uptight urban curator to, to something that, that kind of goes into specific stories, more personal kind of attachments to historical sites as well. And one of the things that came out of the Future Island was to, to make it somehow productive and make it uh, somehow a working session as well that also leads to specific production. It leads to production of certain kind of workshops that, that also did, like I said, you did like two workshops um, um, in spring and, and recently. And, and also it, it, it took a format of inviting Ingela to, to become a research in residence and sort of map out specific uh, associations on the island that took care of specific memorials and look into this kind of structure of the, I don't think that I pronounce it nice, the Hamburg Hamburg Sport, yeah, so that's a kind of a, uh, association of, of locally engaged people who do kind of free work for establishing a certain kind of uh, memorial space or take care of very specific historical events and, and uh, historical heritage. And so we basically, um, this is a kind of a, it looks a little bit biblical, but I think it really tells you a little bit about the, the, the dynamics and the, and the energy between how how we came together. On the, on the left side is my, my former colleague, Anna Norbay, who is also an artist, and he's kind of, he was the, she was the, the person who took care of more the, the local um, collaborations, then Ingela Osa, and then um, the lady on the right with the huge hair. Uh, she's Cecilia Galin, who's an art historian and uh, a gestalt psychologist. And we came together, that was my, actually my last bigger project last December for a week, and we toured around the island, different specific sites, historical sites as well, meeting up the people that already we started to collaborate two years ago. And this means that the, the man in the middle, uh, Gunnar Stellan, is, is a real gem, a real diamond on the island. He's a, he's a local historian, he, he runs a small um, uh, boat museum, and he's kind of a source of information regarding industry and a lot of other historical background of the island. So he, Gunnar, became one of our kind of protagonists in this future island and, and towards Lita International situation. And he was very happy to receive almost all our visitors uh, ended up in, in, in the northeast part of the island and was received by him and was introduced to specific uh, topics. And, and, and actually we are sitting in the archive of the industrial um, I mean, sleep as industry that, that was brought together by, by, by basically pensioners who spend their life working in the summit factory. So basically, um, towards Sita International is meant to be, you know, to investigate site-specific situations, post-industrial developments, landscaping combined with permanently and temporarily sited interventions, sculptural architectural elements, participatory projects, that can engage conversations, 
my, I mean, the dilemmas also around some, some urgencies and political issues such as migration, cultural integration and regeneration, which is also very important on the island. And it's kind of we decided that it's embedded in Slita, it's embedded in this industrial uh, part because for me it was, since I moved to the island, it represented a holy triangle of all the things that was very present on Lotna. It's the fascinating landscapes, the industry, the industrial history, post-industrial sites, and also um, a certain kind of military history that also talks a lot about the island looked at from a defensive point of view. And basically, the, the, what I'd like to sort of... Uh, I think what... I'd like to sort of finish here because I want to give, this is also kind of one of the situations that I wanted to show that, that this part of our trip, I mean the basic thing is not visible, this is a memorial of Latvian refugees and that was from, from our last, uh, last December journey, but uh, I basically, this was basically an outline why we are here together and I saw that um, this was also a, a kind of a basis of, a, of thinking about what an institution can do in, I wouldn't say peripheral, but more like in a liminal space, more like in a, in a kind of a frontier zone, and, and something in between different geographical and historical uh, situations. And uh, I think, I don't know, if, if, if you have immediate questions, I can answer, but I think I would suggest that we move on. And, um, and I give the floor to Osa, and then to Inga. And, It has to hang in the air the whole evening. <laughs> so, 
So I'm also going to talk a little bit about the product um, uh, where I've been researching on um, a potato variety that was bred for the socialist farming cultural system. I know that in Slovakia it's called something else. Uh, the, the, the socialist industrial farming system. Uh, did, did it, um, Exactly. Okay, so the potato variety was bred to fit into this system. And so we're going to continue a little bit with questions. So, so this is a potato variety. And, um, I mean, if you look at it, how would you describe it? Like what kind of, uh, what do you see? If, if you see this variety, uh, I mean this question is, is very simple, okay? But, uh, so, just say some things of what you see on this potato. It's bleeding because of the color. Yeah. And something else? There are some other things. This is another potato variety. Can you see something with this potato variety? <laughs> a kiwi. Ah, it's like a kiwi. No. What? Like you mean the shape? Yeah, yeah. Like in the middle, but it has this thing. Okay, yeah. So it's a bit like a kiwi. Yeah. That's. That's. Um, I would agree to that. And then this one. Like a chestnut, yeah. So it means that it's more rounder, yeah. Okay, so um, so these three potato uh, the potato varieties, it's, it's different varieties of potato, yeah. Like the same you have with apples, you have uh, all kind of variety, red, green, and with different taste and quality and so on. And this is the same with potato and. Uh, these three uh, potato varieties, they represent three different political economical systems yeah, where, where they are farmed within and, where they, and that they were bred for. So, uh, so if, you, if you look at them, which variety do you think was bred for, for, for the socialist industrial farming system? Hmm? The second one, uh, the second one, this one, uh, no, it's not this one actually, <laughs> but I can tell you, okay, so this, so this variety, it's, um, it's called Linda and it's spread for the capitalist industrial farming system. And the reason for that is that it's oval, like you said, like a kiwi. So it's because uh, in the capitalist system, potato varieties are bred slightly oval. The, the shape is slightly oval. And the reason for that is that, that you can make long pommes frites out of it. And there is not so much waste in the pommes frites industry, right? And that is the reason. And this one then, is that the socialist one? You think? Just a quick one. Yeah? Well, that's like a, I made it like a, like a, what do you call that, like a, it, was a, it was a nasty uh, question because it, it's red so you could think it's so but it's actually not. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean it's, so this is, um, this is the potato variety that is bred by a German a small scale organic farmer and uh, it's bred, it, it's bred for, for a system that you, you could not exactly say that it's not uh, capitalist, but it's more inspired by the economy of the commons. Yeah? The commons, uh, which is uh, like an open source economy where you share, where you share things. So for example, this farmer is not uh, collecting royalties on this variety. He shares it with people and it's actually also not even uh, registered in any uh, of, 
of this um, system that you have to register the plant to write into in order to collect royalties. So therefore he must sell it as food only, because you are not allowed to sell it as a, a seed, a plant to seed and to grow on. So it's existing in, um, in a kind of a legal grey zone, uh, because the system um, of the hegemonic system of farming today is a, a capitalist um, system where you collect royalties of the plant. Okay, so this is the socialist. This is the socialist uh, potato variety. And what is it about it? Okay, you cannot guess this because it's beyond your <laughs> your, your great uh, fantasy, I think. But the reason uh, the reason why it's round is like this. So. After the Second World War, when, um, I mean, you had it in Slovakia too, but this was bred in, in East Germany, in the, in the DDI. Uh, when the large uh, industrial farming units were developed, and they built huge farming machines, uh, like harvest machines, they didn't think of that actually the existing potato varieties they were bred for this uh, other system that, that this variety represents, which is the small-scale farming system. And so um, what happened was that the old varieties, uh, they, got, um, they were thrown around in the big harvest machines, and they got bruises, and potatoes are actually the same like apples, that if you throw them here and there, they get damaged and they started to rotten. And the potatoes started to rotten in the basements uh, of the people living in, uh, this was in East Germany. And it became a major political problem because potato is, as you can imagine, is the basic sustenance, right? So if the potato that you got, which was your uh, portion that you should live from over the winter, when it starts to rotten, you get really afraid because there is no other food to get, right? So the breeders had a lot of pressure to develop a potato variety that could fit into the new system. And this is the success that actually helped save uh, uh, this uh, socialist farming system for another 15, 10 years. Because it's round like a tennis ball, and this is very important because when it rolls in the harvesting machines, it does not get as damaged as it would um, when it has the other shape. And also it's round because, as you know, people were working every day in a factory or something like that, having lunch in the canteen. And so in the big canteens you had peeling machines and then you have less waste when you have round potatoes. Yeah? So this is to show you how breeding actually is totally intertwined with the political economical system. So what this tells, what this example tells is that farming is a human and also a, a, a more than human engagement. So it involves humans, people, but it also involves plants, soil, bacteria, and so on and so on. So it's political and, um, uh, you know, it, so you can say it's a system that operates the whole farming system and it has dimensions of skills and knowledge and that is both plants and people, yeah? so, so the plants have different skills, as you can see these three different varieties, they have different capacity. And it's the same with the humans who do farming, that you must know how to do it, um, otherwise it's not working, of course. And you have um, dimensions of economy, as you can see in the example, and also of sociality, so how you live together, right? So farming in different systems mean different forms of relations, of knowledges, and of economies. And this is visible in how plants are bred to suit different farming systems. 
So if you have one variety, it cannot just be transferred into the other system without both the system and the plant having to adapt to the new condition. You know? So it's intertwined. You cannot just easily take something out from one system and put it into a new system without it changing that system. So, so I am an artist, and this example of potatoes' relation uh, and their relation to the form and the agency they have. So there is a relation between the form and content, their agency, and also the narrative that they uh, engage in, for example, the political system, or uh, the narrative that they carry because they are also, in a way, agents for the narrative. Um, so they help me to understand all the problems of artistic inquiry. Because the category of art, it also operates in a similar way in systems of skills and knowledge. So for example, today, uh, maybe some people would agree with me that Artistic practice is maybe more about knowledge than skill. Right? When I was young, I had to learn how to draw and all that, but today maybe that's not very important, but it had been at times. Uh, it's of course, there's of course a dimension of economy. This is something that we discuss a lot as artists. What kind of economy we, we we represent uh, and we would like not to represent or we would long to have and so on and so on. And of course there is a dimension of sociality. So uh, it's part of the social life and it connects people and it divides people and, uh, and carry narratives. And something that I would like to mention in this regard is uh, something called Kegel the Ancien et the Modern, or the quarrel of the ancients and the moderns. And I don't know if you um, if you're familiar with this argument, but I find it very very important to to to, to refer to and to relate to because it's exactly this moment in history where there was a shift of regime in this sense. Yeah. So you go from one system like an ontological, epistemological system to another. And this took place in the early 17th century around the Académie uh, Française, but it was also happening in other parts of Europe. And it was this moment where some people started to say, but listen, uh, we don't want to refer all the time what we do back to, to ancient Greek, uh, culture as a point of reference to what we do. We have reached to another level and we therefore call ourselves modern. It's a way to make a cut and to break to that reference back to, to the ancient as the kind of cultural highlight. And some models actually wanted to prove this and in, in the way of proving it, uh, they started actually to measure uh, the culture and knowledge in order to say uh, and uh, to be able to prove that culture and knowledge have reached a higher level. And very soon uh, these people figured out that it is possible to measure knowledge, they felt, but it has to be then uh, knowledge that is uh, either containing mathematics or has like a very fact based uh, content. And this was actually the moment where science as a knowledge, like the natural sciences, were kind of um, withdrew from the rest of the arts, so to speak, because these were the measurable knowledges. And this is the moment also where, where um, academies of science were established, right? So this is, this is like this moment in history where you suddenly had something called, um, called art and science, culture, nature, civilization, wilderness, humans, non-humans, and all of that, okay, yeah, all of that. So, and, and I 
for me, this division is really important to think of and to understand as an historical event because I am born into the big narration of arts and science. And this is how I have grown up, and this is the narrative that has shaped my understanding also of my own practice as an artist. But I feel very strongly that, I've, that these categories are um, sliding at the moment. And I think we are in a new historical uh, moment now where this uh, categorization is changing because there are so many things in the real world around us that are changing and making this kind of separation impossible. Um, and this is a little bit, in a way, why I work with cultivated plants. Because cultivated plants are hybrids in such uh, uh, categorization. Because cultivated plants, they are neither entirely wild, yeah? you don't find exactly this kind of, of plants when you go out in the forest, and they are also not entirely artifacts. Yeah? We can never totally tame, so to speak, this, or it's not, it's a different category. So it's a hybrid, it's in between. So it doesn't fit into that system, but it also, on the other hand, is very important for us, it nurtures us. So, so cultivated plants, they have come about uh, through a dialogue between humans and plants that's been going on since deep time. So for example, cabbage uh, is a plant that you can find wild in Europe. Uh, but the cabbages we eat, they have developed into their different varieties over uh, deep time, which means like thousands of years, like prehistoric time. And this is how this broad diversity has developed uh, and, and manifested. So, so these are some potato varieties that I have bred myself together with a, a gardener called Matze Wilkins. And uh, I love these potatoes because of their shape and color. For me, they have very strong uh, sculptural qualities. Uh, when, when we dig them up in, this, in, the, in the fall, it's like having ready-made sculptures. So my question is, when I engage in this breeding of new varieties and in this dialogue with the plants, so I'm fascinated by the plant's capacity, as I said, to develop all these qualities. And here are just some photos from uh, our last harvest. So, just to show you how we do it. So they come in all kinds of uh, surprising shapes and colors that we couldn't know, you know, when we planted. So it's always very exciting. So my question is, so what is my role in this plant-human dialogue? What is it that, that I engage in, and also my friend, who is a gardener, and, and, and how, can, how, can, how can we talk about what we are doing? And if I think of myself as an artist, and the qualities that I appreciate in these plants, what is that, you know? How, how, can I, how, how can I relate to that? So these are the questions that inform uh, the inquiry of my work, so this is what I Somehow, look for, I look for ways to describe and circulate it, but I don't know, maybe my time is out, actually. Yeah, okay. Because, actually, I wanted to say this in order to come to, to this project about the socialist potato writing. Because, for me, it's really interesting to study um, something that is developed for uh, a, a political, economical system that does not really uh, operate anymore. Because it makes it possible for me to see the system that I uh, live within in a different way. Yeah? I, it's something that, that, that informs that. And, and this project I do together with an artist called Elske Rosenfeld. And she grew up in the GDR. Um, and what we do in this project is that we compare a photographic archive uh, with the cultivated plant, in this case the potato, which we also understand as an archive. So we, we kind of read these two archives together. Uh, 
So this photographic archive, I can tell more about this tomorrow for those of you who come to the workshop that continues tomorrow at Transit. Uh, and then I can tell more about it. But So we look at these two uh, ways of, of um, storing information because cultivated plants are also actually um, containers of, of archived information, right? And then we can look at how they travel through different systems. Because this photographic archive was um, developed for the socialist system as a kind of a documentation of that whole process. And in the same way as the potato variety Adretta was. But the interesting thing with the, the, the variety Adretta is that today, this potato that was made for the socialist system is now, has now become uh, the protagonist and the kind of life keeper of all the people that have become excluded by um, the kind of hardcore capitalist system that, that uh, invaded uh, Russia and the, the former uh, Soviet countries. I'm curious to know if Adelta was grown also in Slovakia. We have not figured that out yet, actually. Um, so these are some photographs from the basement of this uh, woman who is farming in the village Dikvornia in Russia. And it's our artist friend Misha Lilov, who is a Russian artist who took these photos. He was investigating in the village where he comes from in Russia. Um, so actually, the, the same qualities um, the same qualities of a potato uh, that was bred for the socialist system is now uh, supporting the people who cannot uh, survive in that capitalist system uh, because they don't have jobs or the economy is not strong enough. And in this sense you can understand this variety as a subversive element. Yeah? You, we talk about it as a dormant, dormant capacity that actually has a capacity um, to break into a new system and, and, and actually force that system to change. So in this sense, um, there is a radicality in, in these agents that we look into and we are interested in. And this is also, by the way, why the seed regulations, uh, not only in EU, but actually globally, are as strong as they are, and, and also in all these CETA, TIP discussions, and so on and so on, they also contain this dimension of seed regulations. Because, um, because actually, um, the interest of having strong control over these elements has to do about the danger of the subversive capacity of the seeds that do not follow that system uh, that these people in power would like uh, to. Uh, to be all over. Yeah. Anyway, so this is uh, this is a little bit somehow some uh, questions that I'm interested in and that I don't have an answer to. And if you join tomorrow, I would love to talk more about this. <laughs> Thank you. I, I don't know if you have direct questions or we can uh, go on. Yeah. Ah, uh, from the first. Yeah, so, the, so it's like this, okay, so if you just water, so you should not water only with urine directly on the plants because it can burn them, it's too strong, yeah? So you have to, to mix your urine, uh, so for example, one to ten, mix it with the water, and you should pour it immediately on the plants, and urine, uh, maybe you know, it has no bacteria uh, unless you have some infection in your body, but otherwise it's totally pure, you can drink it like some people do uh, in, in uh, Ayurvedic tradition. And, and, and actually the urine contain all the, uh, the potassium, the nitrogen and um, the phosphor that the plants need. And this is the, the elements that you have in the synthetic fertilizer, right? So in all these debates of how to, you know, how to, um, the apocalyptic narrative of that we will be too many people on earth and blah 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 blah. There is a super simple answer to that. Just collect people's urine, pour it in the fields, and even the WHO organization is saying this in their reports. If we could just learn to take care of our own waste, it's enough for us to feed ourselves, right? 
but it's a taboo. We never talk about it. We don't do it. We, we are afraid even of thinking it. Yeah. So if I would serve this basil on a wonderful pasta for my friends, maybe I don't dare to say it's from my own green uh, water, but it is. And and you know, it's actually we are nurturing elements. We are not only uh, destroying elements. Yeah. We are actually rich in this sense. And and I find it just interesting to change that story. Um, yeah, so that was the answer. <laughs>
it was at the time uh, occurring um, at the same time as the, as the political uprising uh, during the Arab Spring and the Occupy movement. Uh, so and it was many more struggles. And I began with this research 2009. So it has been going through these different political shifts since then. And today we are experiencing a new shift of solidarity uh, with political struggles, uh, not the least the political conservative, conservatism and the awake of fascism in Europe. So for me this has been an interesting project just to see where are we now in the solidarity efforts and where were we in the 60s and 70s. And you can see the high meters, uh, it's just like a low loop of um, a loop of images, uh, which is this is from the Tiansen Konst Hall where I exhibited the strike art collection. Um, so I've been interested in how to preserve this art collection, how you treat it as a document of a solidarity. Um, and that kind of seems lost today in the capitalist ideology to really take care of these kind of treasures. And it wasn't an easy task to persuade a local museum uh, at the municipality at the Alivari to support my research. Um, it, because it's this strike is so it's such a, so much of a conflict still today. So when you think of it was like 40 years ago, and you think that it, it would be easy somehow to uh, research into this specific period and to dive into this kind of collective memory. Uh, you are much surprised because it's still like very uh, like a wound that hasn't really healed. Um, so when I approached a local museum in Yellowbury, I had to sort of also find a good angle uh, so that I would get the support. And I sort of, I, my idea then was to present this research in terms like I would look into the solidarity movement uh, and the support of culture workers who went up to this specific strike. Uh, and this was then uh, something that was negotiated for a very long time. Uh, but then I started and it went really well. I got a lot of local support. Uh, I think also because I came from another um, region in Sweden. I was uh, also then an outsider. Uh, but I have like roots uh, in the industrial society in the south. I have uh, come from a family of uh, working class. So it was sort of easy in a way for me to find my way in. Um, so the outstanding, outstanding and broad social engagement and activism for the strikers' course is particularly interesting because it included different culture workers who mirrored this situation in various works. I believe then that this, this strike um, contributed to a general radicalization <coughs> process in Sweden. Actors from various fields um, uh, stepped up to support the strike to promote a more equal society. Like curators who even outdoors gluing posters, for example, theatre companies put a place in mining place theatres in the mining districts and filmmakers documented um, the strike meetings. Experimental activities at this time started to begin uh, to uh, establish an, um, a structure to capture this new and social, new social and political movements. Uh, I can go into details uh, for the intercultural landscape, but I will just give you a brief introduction to this project because it's so complex and it has so many layers. Um, so uh, my idea was to recontextualize this art collection and to look at the strike from two different angles, uh, from the mining struggles and from the art and culture workers' struggles to gather a broad understanding of the general atmosphere around the 68 movement. Um, it's difficult to comprehend today what was at stake at that time, of course, in general, and what was at stake for the leftist movement at that time. Um, so, um, the process to research the strike was difficult as it is a zone of conflict still and 
um, how to to work with that conflict zone. That was like a, a big nut for me to, to crack actually. Um, but I will just give you a brief introduction to the strike itself, the history. It started the 9th of December of 9, in 1969 um, and then erupted at the ore field in Norrbotten and it produced a counter image of the Swedish welfare politics. It, was, um, it became very well known very quickly. It was broadcasted all over in news and tele television. And so it was 4,800 miners um, that all worked at this state-owned company called Elko AB. They are still the biggest company, uh, mining company in Sweden. Uh, it's called Lustavar Kionavara AB, and it's located in the Svapavar Kionavara area. And so this strike uh, lasted for 57 days. Uh, and this reason for the strike was many. Uh, they were um, subject to a very harsh time study system and the LKAB pushed down the price rates quite hard. Uh, the workers demanded fixed wages. Um, the company structure was, was very hierarchical and they had like leadership tenants that you, uh, which declared that an employee should only simple follow orders and not uh, question any orders. Um, so this, it, 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 the strike itself became a major critique towards the Swedish folk and uh, the vision of the welfare state, which was then known across the world uh, for its egalitarian ideas. Uh, and it was like assumed internationally that the workers at the Swedish, Sweden's largest state-owned company labored on the, under the best conditions in the world. So this news spread globally, I would say, at least in Europe. Um, so this strike challenged this spirit of unity, which is an unity between the state and the private uh, employers association, uh, private enterprises in Sweden. It's the, that is exactly, uh, sp specifically uh, about the Swedish model. It's a collaboration between the state and private enterprises. Um, so I don't know how deep I should go into the strike <laughs> itself. Uh, it might be interesting also to hear that there were many political groups um, sociologists, journalists, activists and culture workers visiting the, the miners. There were big meetings, um, which is a very democratic way of having a meeting. Is to, you basically you, you invite everybody and you have your of course, organization of that meeting, but it's, it's very sort of flat in a way. So for the m many young people at that time, the, the miners strike um, was important and they, it sort of represented the ideal of how to revolutionize the society. So the Communist Union of Marxist Leninists offered the support of spreading propaganda. Um, the party played an important role during the Vietnamese, Vietnam War by organizing solidarity work through the NF, NLF groups. Um, so despite the fact that many political uh, groups wanting, wanted to support the strike, the strike committee was clear that it, it was their strike and no outside group would be allowed to compromise the unity. Appearing united strengthened their negotiation position against this mining company at Gorby and made it possible for the miners to negotiate for themselves without the involvement of this trade union organization. But then the, the front didn't last more than 57 days. Um, they had a lot of uh, gigantic pressure from the Social Democratic uh, Party and uh, the strike became fragmented and they used sort of also corrupt methods. They were wiretapping the miners and they infiltrated it with the special agents at that time. Uh, like the information bureau was up at the mining strike. Um, and also the miners often felt like the journalists were painting a false image of the strike or that they were held back. At that time many state institutions were run through with repressive tolerance uh, against voices deemed 
too political or too radical. So what did the culture workers do then? Alternative channels and forms of distribution were created in reaction to state control of public institutions. For example, the Film Centrum, the film centrum, uh, Center emerged in May 1968 to organize the independent, the independent filmmakers and provide production support. According to Film Centrum's motto, filmmakers should go out into the society and document factories and industries using simple means in order to create a quick documentary report. A concrete suggestion for making films projects available for a broader audience was to use the existing channels of distribution and inventory of all film projectors in all Folketshus, it's specific it's a specific community center in Sweden called Folketshus. Uh, and they also organized other public venues across Sweden. And through the socialist organization Kvartir and NLF movement, uh, they, organized the, they were sort of organizing exhibitions where artworks were auctioned off to benefit the uh, Vietnamese cause, but also then later they used the same channels to collect um, works from artists. Is, is, yes, exactly, this is the art collection. And it's uh, donated artworks from artists all over Sweden, and, and they were sold, many were sold, but uh, also artworks were directly sent up to the striking miners, and the money went through this specific strike fund so that they, the economy would lost as they were not supported by the trade union. So it was a way to um, survive. So it was a, they had a huge support uh, from different culture fields, uh, which makes this strike and this solidarity uh, movement so interesting. And also the modern music museum were uh, in Stockholm uh, during this, also during the time of Pontus Turtian and uh, his uh, associates or curator. Curator wasn't a known term at that time. Uh, but Peristol, for example, organized um, a smaller exhibition in a, a parallel institution called Filialen, for example. And they also had auctions to collect money for the striking artists. Even very famous writers in Sweden, like Sara Lidman, uh, donated uh, money from a book called The Mine uh, about this region uh, in Norrbotten um, to the striking fund. The strike fund. Uh, but I think it's interesting that the, the or what is I think the most interesting thing is that the, the miners didn't sell these artworks that were sent up to this uh, mining uh, area. They decided to keep it as a momentum of the this, this strike and to keep it as a document actually. So that's um, I think a very uh, interesting gesture. Like uh, they were really interested in culture in many ways. Uh, they were also welcoming the theatre group to actually join them in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in this struggle. Um, so I, I wanted to like, um, show you um, a three, four minute clip of one of the movies that was uh, produced during the, the strike. It's um, a film by uh, Margareta and Alfie Selsson. Um, so if we could just change for the audio. Yeah. Uh, and the audio. So just, yeah, thank you. Göras var enda arbetare till en mentor rubbad in dig kan man säga. Som finnes i precis allting och lojalt stöder allting i en inbildad tro att det är till samhället och allas bästa. Och då är du till en, till en liten, liten grupps bästa. Det bästa var att de kunde ge arbetarna spruta på morgonen eller tablett så att han var alldeles omtecknad och nöjd och belåten och att han stod eller om han kunde operera in eller operera bort till kökten så att han vore precis som en kastrerad häst som jobbade och slet och drog och åt och jobbade och drog och, 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 och slet och så och så vidare och inte bytte så på annat medan andra då fick leva lite. Ja, det var bara någon helt enkelt. Jobbar inte utan man kan placera sig och, och grejer. 
Mi tahansa mennä. Tää oli monttiin piltoon päästä. Vai jopa päin tykkiä mulle. Mulle ei ole piltoon, mutta se tykkii. Virin protestoon. Tässä tein aina sellaista kaikki. Tulee tuolla. Tänne kaikki rahaa niitä kuuli. Eli joka ovi saadaan säikin kuulemaan vastaavaa. Kun tässä on muu joukko se yhden nyt kaikki toisesta äikkeen, niin pöydän jäljää ja voi olla jotain tilaa maailmaa sinulle. Iso apuolta. Ratsa. No se ei taas ole vaan ruokannut tiimu, vaan saa tehdä. Kämtyy sen jopa satsa jo vielä maailmaa. Mutta ei ole kautin hinta viistä, että alla kämtyy saman vuoden yhdessä on iso apuolta. Oist. Kama on Finland viistä. Helt enkelt våld kriser till vårt och protesterar över att vi har ju Maja Volta där i Frankrike. Och det är tio miljoner människor som protesterar. De ökar och strejker som vi i England och det blir flera dagar för dag. Ja, det ska man ju, som jag säger, det är bara en lösning. För det har ju visat sig att det går ju inte med mer reformer som, som sossarna säger i Tyskland. För att, men att bara, bara, bara snacka om att socialisera vissa företag och så vidare. Vad fan hjälper det att socialisera LKB exempelvis? När det vis, precis som ett privatäkt företag, så är det bara på profit. Man ska inte socialisera för det är bara socialisering skulle bli. Då ska man ju även ha med allting. Så att företaget drivs som, som ett verkligt statligt företag, som ett folkhäkt företag. Där folket har medbestämd och inflytande och så vidare i allting. Uh, work of art. 
now I think today, a couple of years later, it's something, you know, this solidarity is present very much, but at that time, 2010, we didn't speak about solidarity like that, how party work we could like support the political cause. Um, and then you have like one chapter uh, evolving around the, um, the left movement, the NLF movement, the Vietnam movement, and also uh, specific theoreticians like Jan Terborn, uh, how he was involved in the strike. So it's different chapters. It's like an archive of 500 pages, and then I have the, the back sides of the paintings as well. Uh, it's it's signed like a gift to the uh, the minor strike by that and that artist. So that's also why I find it interesting to document the backsides uh, more than actually, I mean, also curating or organizing exhibitions. Uh, but for me, it was important to document this um, backside, and the, the, some of these backsides have specific notes. Um, private notes as well, which is very nice. Any other? Okay. Um, it, it's a question and a comment because um, what I find really interesting is two things that are somehow interrelated and that is that on the one hand that um, the workers decided to, to keep the collection, as you said, not to sell it and to use it as a, you know, as, as a platform in order to finance their strike, because obviously this must have been a stress for them that they were running out of money. Mm -hmm. So they kept it, and, and this, for this reason I'm curious on how uh, they were thinking around this decision to keep it, uh, how they were talking about that. And, 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 and why I think these questions are really interesting is because as an artist I'm interested in understanding what kind of role the art had in that very specific political struggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, uh, I think it also was a very quick strike, I mean it's 57 days and it was sort of a chaos um, in these different uh, cities. And um, maybe I think it was, I've traced it so far that I know there was like a local librarian who was very interested in culture and he might be in, um, he had a big impact I think in the north uh, on the culture and there were also like um, syndicalist miners who asked artists to, to donate artworks for example. And also I think it came with this chaos that they were giving, they, they ended up with a lot of gifts in the end, like a ton of shrimps, you know, what to do with this ton of shrimps? <laughs> Could they sell it in the north or like, so that it's, it wasn't only artworks. Um, but I, I truly believe like they, uh, uh, that they, uh, the purpose was for them to, to preserve it for later use. So it was maybe it's this idea of high culture or that painting has something, another symbolic meaning which was important for them. Unfortunately, I could only ask like one or two of the miners and um, they also had bad, bad memory because it went very quick. Uh, but when it comes to theater group, they were specifically invited by like famous strike leaders to come up um, to um, to run plays and also like um, to set up a uh, theater. And when it comes to the documentary filmmakers, uh, Lena Evert, I didn't mention that, and um, um, she was invited uh, also um, to. Or she asked actually, could I help you with together with Lars Westman and her? Collaborate, uh, could I document these big meetings? Uh, so they, they collaborated for uh, months, I don't know how many months, but they also cut the movie together with a, a specific uh, committee, film committee with uh, the miners themselves. Um, did I answer that?
I also have a more practical question. So when you exhibited the collection of textiles, I was just kind of wondering how did it translate in a much more contemporary environment to the white cube when you exhibited the collection? Uh, it, um, we organized the seminars and I also had guided tours. I uh, also collaborated with Kurt and Maria Lind to, to organize the, uh, the hanging and the, the whole program together with Tien Stenkonst Hall. And so we had like, um, I had like three guided tours or something during a couple of months where I was exhibiting and the whole Tien uh, context is very interesting. It's a, uh, it's a far out, um, suburb to, uh, in Stockholm which has a lot of economical, political problems uh, where actually the, the working class are today. Uh, but it's, it was also quite difficult to get people locally who lived in Tienst to get in to see the, the show. Uh, but it's something that the institution has to work on, like how do you mediate uh, like the content of an institution and how do you work. It's really difficult for me as an artist to go out on the street <laughs> to invite people in. Uh, but I think uh, it was very nicely implemented at Tienst Kunst Hall. And we also had this witness seminar, uh, which I spoke about before, together with Söder Törn, where we invited um, um, persons that were involved in the strike uh, to come together again to speak about specific issues and why they joined the, the, the course of the strike and what they produced. I had that twice actually at Konstas uh, and at Tienstad Konstal. So I think we used different medias in order to to get a broader reception of the, the work.